It's so good to see you. I know there'll be some others who will, will be joining us as we move along. Um, it's, it's always a pleasure to connect even on Zoom. It's one of the, the, the nice things that, have, that has happened. Um, you know, out of the whole COVID thing, we got this new way to stay connected and do things. So I want to start by uh, playing an excerpt, a holiday, uh, something to get us in the holiday mood. Um, a video from from the orchestra from several years ago, actually. So let me get it all set up. In case you didn't, it was the Waltz of the Flowers from Tchaikovsky's Nutcracker, um, and that was recorded, I guess we did that 10 years ago, um, and it was recorded by our first guest, Brian Ferran. Brian has been recording the orchestra uh, audio and video since, I think, 1998 or 99. So um, as you can see, he's still a very young guy. So he was very young when he first joined uh, joined the orchestra. So Brian, tell us a little bit about who you are and what you do. Sure, thank you, Bob. Um, I I I knew one of the. Um, oh, here we go. I knew one of your uh, violin players. Back then, we were actually we used to play hockey together. So um, we um, I back then in the in the nineties, uh, my family was the church choir. We were asked to sing for the Pope one year, but we needed to provide a uh, a recording. So when we um, when we purchased the equipment to record ourselves, I was fascinated by it, and I I learned started to learn a lot more about it. Um, at the same time, our family decided to uh, pursue opening up a recording studio. 
um, we were able to make some good recordings. Um, a handful of, there was a lot of interest in it at that time. So we, uh, we launched and I think it was uh, 1996 officially opened a recording studio in Vernon, New Jersey. Um, yes, yeah, shortly after that, I met Bob. Um, we, um, we started just recording audio. Um, a few years later, uh, I started getting into video and started, uh, started recording with one camera. Uh, I think the next, literally the second concert I did, I did with two cameras uh, and I never did a concert with less than one camera after that. Um, it was, uh, it's, it's something I'm fascinated with. I went on to study uh, photography later on and um, yeah, it's, uh, it, it was, it was always, it was always a, a, an awesome journey that I wanted to know more about. I wanted to do more with, um, and uh, Bob actually gave me the opportunity to be able to expand what I'm doing by getting that, that real experience with the orchestra. So in a sense, um, I was able to grow mostly because of the orchestra and the involvement with the orchestra allowed me to. Oh, that's great, Brian. And, um, and we've gone from one camera to two cameras to I think we recently did six cameras. Um, yeah, I, I think there were, I think there were six, uh, <laughs> unless you count Hughes cameras, then we could say maybe there were eight. Um, <laughs> it was, it was quite a, quite a thing. We didn't miss anything. I think we had every angle covered. Yeah, it was, it was interesting. Well, speaking of that, um, the next play, I want to introduce our uh, next guest, but I'd like to play something. I met Hugh. Um, I don't remember when I met Hugh. Uh, four years ago, five years ago, something at a dinner in, in New York with the New York Classical Music Society. Um, but the first time I actually got to hear him, him play and, and I met Madalena was at uh, in Paris this past June. And they came up to me and they were doing music for hands. We're going to meet them and who they are individually first and talk about the piano, piano repertoire later. But uh, they came up to me and we were talking and they asked if I'd ever do a, a concerto, a performance for concerto for piano four hands. And I said, I'd never heard of, I didn't know that there was any. And they said, oh yeah, we found one uh, by Leopold Kozlik, who was a composer a name that I knew as a musicologist, but I had to admit I'd never heard any of his music before. So I said, yeah, well, it, it, if you can find the music, I'd be happy to do it. And so uh, I think it was Madalena said, oh, we found the music. So I said, okay, so we programmed it in November and um, I'd like to, before I introduce them, play a little bit of the first movement.
gives you a little bit of what Kozilek's music sounds like and this charming, wonderful discovery. So let's meet those two wonderful soloists. Uh, Madalena, maybe you can go first. Tell us, who are you and what do you do? And just let us know who you are. I don't think I have a clear answer to this. <laughs> <laughs> um, but um, hold on, let me switch to my AirPods. I don't know if it's working. Okay. Um, so my name is Madalina. I'm uh, from Romania and I moved to the States three years ago to continue studying music. And uh, I went to Temple uh, for um, a degree in master's performance in uh, chamber music and accompanying. Uh, previously, I had spent uh, quite a lot of time uh, uh, studying music and piano performance in uh, the Bucharest Conservatory in Romania. And um, currently I am pursuing my DMA degree, uh, my doctoral studies uh, also at Temple. So I continued um, uh, the journey that I had started uh, three years ago. And um, meeting Hugh and uh, starting this uh, forehand journey uh, together it's more than a project, it's a journey. Um, it's something that we learn about every day. Uh, we don't only learn about music, uh, the pieces that we play, but also we learn about each other, about 
the dynamic that that's created between chamber musicians because we both have uh, a serious solid chamber music background but this um a duo, this forehand duo, requires something more than just a piano violin or a piano, um, I don't know, flute or a piano singer or something like that. It requires something a little bit uh, specific and a little bit more different than other uh, duos. And because we know, we know our instruments, and uh, let's say that we have a tendency to, I said, to ask a little bit more than we would ask, let's say from uh, another partner or, or partners that uh, are string players or wind players or something like that. So um, it's, we are a little bit more demanding um, from each other. And um, so far it's been a wonderful journey. And for me, uh, having performed this uh, Kozilu concerto with, with him, with your orchestra and with you, of course, conducting, um, it's been a, an unexpected uh, experience and a very, very pleasant experience. And hopefully we're going to get to um, uh, repeat it. But um, to come back to your question, um, I'm just, I'm grateful for, again, for having uh, started this journey with, uh, with you and uh, for being given the opportunity to, you know, expand my uh, chances of uh, studying music and um, discovering what's out there. It's not only, okay, I go to Temple, I finish my degrees and it sounds very boring. And probably if I, uh, if I was limited to that, probably it, it would be very boring, but uh, I don't. I try to get off campus uh, as much as I can so that you know, I get more chances to, to explore the musical environment that's around here. So um, I, I think this is the best answer I can give right now. That sounds good to me. Um, sounds really good. Hugh, tell us who you are. So uh, can everybody hear me? I'm just testing yeah. out my own spacebar little technique here. So yes, I'm a Korean American pianist. I was actually born in Philadelphia. My parents emigrated from Korea and I am a graduate of the Curtis Institute of Music. I graduated from Curtis and then immediately was employed by Curtis and I was faculty member there for 19 years as director of instrumental accompaniment and the director of the student um, recitals series. Um, so uh, I, I've been playing chamber music all around the world with lots of different people. And another thing that my dual passion is not only music, but also technology. Uh, I um, One of the things that I struggle with was having a, a bad memory, bad memory in the sense of I always forget my music. I'd leave it at home, leave it at the office and never have the right music. And I've had so many trips where I would fly to another city, getting ready to play an important concert, looking through my knapsack and <gasps> realizing oh, I forgot to bring that one piece of music. I think I've ruined so many auditions with uh, different people that are now very prominent musicians despite my incompetence. But I remember one time I was driving up the New Jersey Turnpike to play a, a major audition for a clarinetist who, who is now the principal clarinetist of the New York Phil. I almost ruined his early career because I was halfway up the Turnpike and I realized I didn't bring my music with me. Ah, oh, I had to call, call him up and apologize. Fortunately, he was able to find somebody else that, but all these things just drove me nuts. You know, it was one thing that I think really crippled some of the things that I was doing as a musician, just the stress of remembering to bring my music. So that led me to go into the techie direction. So I now keep in mind, this is well before anything like an iPad or even Kindles or anything like that. I was dreaming about the possibility of having all of my music on a single device and being able to turn pages hands free. And uh, in Back way back in 2001, I that I, I Microsoft came up with this tablet, so I pursued um, the development of a wireless page turning pedal. I was probably one of the first digital uh, sheet music pianists, one of the first pianists, professional pianists to go paperless back then. And then I started my own company, and thanks to that company, it's called Air Turn. We made these pedals that people are using all around the world now, and then. Uh, I was able to leave Curtis, and I, I had a wonderful time at Curtis, but I left to do business 
and technology full time for a couple of years. And then um, after about six years of doing the business, I sold my shares. And now I, I then I was, was contacted by some old friends of mine who said, hey, would you like to come and work with us for Cunningham Piano? And I said, sure, why not? You know, because uh, after my air turn experience, I had uh, developed a new passion for business. I really enjoyed understanding how business works. And I thought, this sounds like fun. Let's give it a try. And uh, so now I'm the vice president uh, of Cunningham Piano, one of America's oldest piano stores. We've been in business since 1891. And of course, I bring my techie chops into my position where I make lots and lots of videos and uh, we'll do video. In fact, uh, one time, I think uh, one of my colleagues visited a training session for Yamaha because we're, one, we're the leading Yamaha dealer in the area. We have these national uh, training <laughs> sessions and um, they, they you know, talk to all the dealers around the country about we you know ways to make their business more effective. And one section was marketing and how do you market on the internet? And uh, whose video was up there demonstrating how to make videos and how to sell pianos? <laughs> so yes, so I've been really into making videos and when Madalena and I started the, this group together, I said, yeah, but it'd be great if we could make a video every week. And so we've been, uh, we've been doing that. We've created our own podcast. If you go to our website at madahue.com, you can see all the links to our podcast episodes. We're at episode, I think, what, 12 or 13 or something like that? No, but I'm coming up to episode 12 soon. 12, yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So, and, and this month is all Christmas themes. So having a blast combining my piano, my business. And part of the business thing, too, is figuring out how can I you know, use our ensemble to grow our branding, grow our presence on the internet and with our audiences around and try to find more opportunities for Madalena and myself to play more concerts. And uh, so if you please check out our YouTube videos, we're on Apple Podcasts and all podcast streaming platforms and uh, check out our weekly journey. It's a lot of fun. And I, I do all the production for that. So it's a lot of fun. Great, Hugh. Uh, I didn't know that much tech background from you, so it's good to, to learn what you do. Um, if you could write your um, the uh, your website that, that you wanted, put it in the chat uh, for everybody, I, I think would be easier. Okay, I'm going to go back to uh, um, to Brian in a minute, but I want to show a, an excerpt from a, re the, a recent concert. Actually, the same concert we did was back in November. Um, and I premiered a, um, a piece that I wrote for the first time ever. We, we used worked with choreographer and dancers. And um, Brian, working with me and, and, and other groups as well, Brian has recorded not just the orchestra. He's recorded chamber music concerts with us. And now he's recorded a dance performance with us. He's recorded opera with us. So he's... He's recorded not just the orchestra, but many different types. So let's look a little bit at this piece. I call it the amiable concert um, with the choreographer. And then Brian, maybe you can tell us what the challenge is to different types of, of performances. Um, how does doing, working with the dancers differ from, with the orchestra? How does doing orchestra differ from doing orchestra with concerto soloists? But let's watch a little bit first.
And so, Brian, is, is there much of a difference or what are the challenges different to doing an orchestra versus doing opera versus doing orchestra with with soloists as you've done? Just um, just how do you approach the differences? What do you find is uh, different challenges? Well, we can start with dance. Um, dance can be complicated in a sense that if you if you don't have a shot of the entire stage at all times, you can miss certain things that happen on the ends that seem to happen very fast. Um, another thing with dance is they, you can't get too close because there could be certain movements with, um, with the, the, the legs and the, 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 uh, the positioning, the, the entire posture of the body. So you, you have to get, the entire head to toe of the, uh, of the dancers. Um, with orchestra, you need a shot of the full orchestra, but the, the rare thing with orchestra is the, uh, the close-ups, the extreme close-ups, the, the fingers pushing on the piano, the, um, the bow going across the strings. Um, if you can work those shots into orchestra, uh, it's really, really good. Um, so I try to do that. Um, with uh, chamber music, again, we need, um, we need a, a shot of the room or the, the church, the venue at which it's, it, it is, um, with them in perspective to uh, just to, to capture, to be able to cut away to, and then those close-ups um, and or highlighting soloists who may be playing at that time. Um, opera is more focused on the actors and the, um, the dialogue, the, the performance of, of wherever they have it staged than it is on the musicians and the orchestra associated with the opera. Um, Audio is a very, very big part of what I do. Um, having been an audio engineer first, um, I use uh, large diaphragms, large diaphragm condensers um, to, to capture the orchestra. In the event that I need, um, that I need a, a more focused sound, I'll use different microphones. Um, I'll even group mic certain groups within the orchestra to capture their sound so I can better mix it. Um, if we have a nice space that we're playing in, like Dolan Hall is a nice space to play in, in a sense that when, um, when everybody is on stage, everybody is playing or even singing, you can actually get a good blend from the hall itself. Um, you can use the hall to assist in your mixing like I try to sometimes um, in the event that we're recording in an area where the, um, the instruments don't come through, I have to consider putting extra microphones in and close to the areas that we need to highlight for the specific piece that we're recording. Um, so there are, there are always different considerations. Lighting is also a big consideration. Uh, it's, when you're when you're recording in multiple locations and uh, sometimes you don't get a chance to go there beforehand, <laughs> you you don't know everything that's going to all your circumstances or all your um, factors that are going to come to play when it comes to uh, to recording. But it's all fun. Terrific. Thank you, Brian. Um, I wanted to introduce you to Salvatore, but I'm not sure I don't. I, he's not sitting at his. And his little little cubicle over there. So I'll, I'll wait until um, he he comes back um, because we are playing tomorrow at at his salon in, in Madison. And um, if you're in the Madison area, stop by, have a snack, good company. We are going to be streaming it. Brian and I are working on 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 the whole streaming technique. So I hope you'll you'll join us for that. And hopefully Salvatore will come back and say hello in a few minutes. Meantime, I want to go back to, to talking with Hugh and Madalena about how they find repertoire, how they develop repertoire. Um, yeah. And before I do that, I want to play another excerpt from, from the last concert. Um, they did this for me. I heard them do it in, 
in uh, in Paris, and I fell in love with how they play together, how they their variety, the variety of music. They recently played at the Mecca Holiday Festival, and they did a such a incredible variety of music. Um, they, they, their music ranges from Tchaikovsky and Sasson to arrangements of Billy Joel and, and other songs. So I'm going to play one that I particularly liked, and they were kind enough to do it as their encore at the, at the last concert. <laughs> You guys look like you're having so much fun when you're playing. Oh, not at all. It's all clinical. It's all business. No, we, we, oh, we, no, we're no not allowed to have fun. No, no, no. Um, so tell us a little bit about how you find your repertoire. And um, when you do these arrangements uh, of things that uh, like like you did at the, at the holiday festival, Thanksgiving and other things, who does your, do you guys do your own arranging? Um, how do you figure out what you want to play? How do you learn all this stuff together and just the whole process um well the tico tico piece i mean we didn't arrange it we wish we we did but we let's say we added our own thing yeah so we uh imprinted our own you know um imagination and uh, like i said we had a lot of um stuff there just to make it sound I mean, more interesting more orchestral more everything you know uh but um uh the f actually uh, for the last two episodes <clears throat> of the podcast we've been playing our own arrangements and if you uh, give a look on youtube uh you're gonna see so we've been working on arrangements from um um peanuts like a winter song, like skating, Christmas time, there's Linus and Lucy coming up. Um, and uh, I mean, we still um, choose pieces that have been written specifically for four hands or have been arranged for four hands, but we are trying to also be more courageous in terms of 
making our own arrangements. And we have a lot of pieces that we would like to um, uh, arrange for four hands because it's very good music. And, um, you know, it's interesting and it's fun to do something that's never been done, obviously. For me, that this is a very big challenge and a very big motivation. Um, but uh, Hugh, uh, I mean, I should give Hugh <laughs> a chance to talk too. Um, when, I mean, we find our own repertoire based on, I don't know, we hear someone else performing something or we get suggestions from, I don't know, friends or um, my own, my, my current teachers or that depends. It's uh, it's just inspiration. I think it's based on inspiration, you know, um, and it, it also depends on future events, uh, future concerts. So we have already started uh, planning concerts for 2023, for summer, for fall. So we have to decide more or less what repertoire should we keep in mind to 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 prepare for that right so yeah Hugh do you want to add something to this sure I think one of the things that I'm hoping for us to do more and more of is to have a whole library of our own arrangements uh, it's a lot of fun to do it's challenging and there is a lot of opportunity there's so much music out there that can be adapted, I think, very nicely for piano for hands. And frankly, Madalena, she's an encyclopedia. She's got an incredible mind and brain, and she just knows repertoire like you, like, like no one I've ever met. So she's got a tremendous grasp of great literature, and she also loves a lot of pop music. And uh, me, I'm I'm uh, I'm a sci-fi and a movie junkie. One of the things I loved to do when I was a kid was to sit in the theater so you know, after maybe watching Star Wars and being blown away or watching Indiana Jones, I'd be sitting in the theater at the end credits, sitting there memorizing the music and the score so that I can improvise and play them for my friends and show off. And I, I love the reaction that people get, oh, it's a song they knew, play it again, because it was like reliving the movie through the music. So I, I've always loved arranging music and um, I've... Uh, written a number of arrangements, actually surprisingly for a lot of flute players. I have a lot of, uh, I have some flutists, uh, one in particular right now who's just actually asked me to write something to give her a line for some holiday music. And uh, another friend of mine who's the concert master out of the um, first principal flute of the Philadelphia Orchestra, he and I actually recorded several albums and we actually have a secret jazz album that I wrote for him too. And coming, uh, so one of the things I love is when we can do things like uh, Billy Joel and we had a friend of ours who's a very, very dear patron. By the way, we do have a Patreon page. And uh, if you'd like to support us, please visit our website at matahue.com. Uh, but he was one of our early patrons. And uh, Tom has been just so generous and kind and supportive. And he was having a party and was we, we wanted to do something for him because he was providing all the food, all the drinks and Tom, is there is there a favorite song that you like? And he came up with, well, I love the the love theme from Superman, you know, the the Christopher Reeve and Margot Kidder version, 1978. Can you read my mind? I thought, okay, sure, all right. So we, it was one of our first arrangements as a thank you gift for uh, you know a dear friend of ours. And so these little opportunities come up all the time. And sometimes it'll be like, oh, we love Billy Joel. Let's do a Billy Joel song or you know Christmas. You know we both love Peanuts. We're both Peanuts fans. So we have to arrange some Vince Guaraldi tunes. Um, so it, the inspirations can just come from great literature. I mean, Madalena, at some point later on, we're going to be doing some real. Uh, wonderful, rich Romanian works. Uh, mm, we started already. Yeah, yeah, we started. Yeah, but you you have a particular arrangement. I can't wait to 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 show in in our upcoming episodes, probably in the spring or so. But um, what's one of the nice things too? I have to say about having or forcing ourselves to have a weekly podcast is we are always this repertoire. We need to learn this piece for this episode. So it keeps us on our toes. And, you know, we want to make it fun. We want to make it engaging. We also want to make it educational so that um, folks who are coming along with us on the journey grow with us so we can share what we're learning, what we're making, and hopefully uh, get more feedback from friends like Tom who say, well, I love this song. Can you make an arrangement? Sure. Why not? 
you know, um, there's something that I would like to add. So because of this uh, work that has uh, developed uh, for arranging for, for our duo, um, I've also uh, considered my DMA topic at Temple to be based on pieces that are arranged for solo piano. So pieces that originally were not written for solo piano, but later on, composers, uh, composers themselves or some of their friends, musicologists, whatever, uh, arrange those particular pieces for solo piano. And uh, it, it's incredible. I mean, I'm thinking because you mentioned Romanian composer, I'm thinking of uh, Enescu. Uh, he, he wrote uh, the very popular two Romanian rhapsodies when he was, what, in his 20s. Uh, it's, it's folk music, but uh, classically uh, adjusted and adapted for orchestra. Everybody knows them. It's it, it it's like popular music, um, and a few years before he died, he uh, adapted the very first one for solo piano. It's an incredibly uh, difficult transcription, and this you know the arranging for four hands and you know knowing about this this uh, this thing just got me thinking, and I thought, you know, not many people. Um, um, are doing work into uh, finding transcription arrangements for uh, piano solo. So I thought, why not? And I, I have found very interesting works that are worth playing. So I'm very much looking forward for that. I'm looking forward to uh, hearing your works and all, uh, and all your discoveries. Um, I want to go back to Brian, talk a little bit about opera, but I want to play an excerpt from an opera. And again, this is something we performed a couple of weeks ago. Um, it's an opera that I wrote called, uh, based on Edgar Allan Poe's uh, story, The Telltale Heart. I want to show the finale. And, and Brian, um, then we'll talk a little bit more about uh, some of the work you do. And I see time is flying by. So any last things you'd like to say? It's quiet now. Beating, 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 ask me what I'm for. 
So Brian, um, any last words about all the the, the challenges of, of recording various types of, of performances? I, I look forward to it. Um, it's something that I enjoy. I, I it's kind of like a puzzle or um, or just a, a a a math problem that I'm trying to solve <laughs> with regards to getting the balance right getting the, uh, the white balance set on the, uh, on all the cameras, um, audio, um, making sure that we can hear everything and, uh, and see everything clearly. Um, and it's, it's absolutely, um, I love it. I absolutely love doing it, um, in everything that I do, um, the audio and, and the uh, visual and the multi-camera <laughs> setting up everything and all the post work that is involved, uh, making sure the, uh, the, the tracks are all lined up, uh, making sure our audio sounds just the way we want it, um, and outputting to the final format. It's all wonderful. And Bob, I wanted to thank you and the orchestra for everything that you have done and um, giving me the opportunity to do. Uh, Brian, it's been a pleasure to, to work, work together. Can't believe we've been doing this for almost 25 years now. <laughs> Time um, flies. And I can't believe we've got 25 years worth of like 10 concerts a year. So it's like, we have like 200 programs um, that we've done. Wow. It's, wow. It's, it's really wonderful. Um, I have one more video I wanna play to, to, uh, when we close, but Hugh, Madalena, do you have any final comments you'd like to make? Anything you'd like to say to anybody? Uh, yeah, come to our concerts <laughs> when you can. And, um, you know, um, we are very much looking forward to um, having more experiences on stage and, and um, in different circumstances with orchestras or um, just by ourselves or, um, you know, I, I was thinking while listening to uh, the opera excerpt, uh, it'd be wonderful to have something like that. I wouldn't call it an opera, but something that would involve or hands and I don't know singers or um, wind instruments or so, so um, bigger ensemble, you know. So the piano uh, piano writing would be more complex because that required for uh, two people. Uh, I don't know, just a lot of ideas. Are good. Or Maybe no. we can put something together together. Yeah, sure. You. Yeah, again, just visit our website at matahue.com. We have a whole list of upcoming concerts. Uh, the rest of this month is actually quite busy. We're going to be squeezing in a couple of Christmas concerts, a New Year's Eve concert. Uh, we're putting together plans to go back to Europe uh, in the summer. And so <laughs> a lot going on. And plus, we you know continue to make our videos every week. That That's, I mean, I'm mean, hearing what Brian says, and he's absolutely right. You know, the, the process of figuring out the cameras, the lights, the sound, the microphone, trying to make everything look and sound its best, and then putting that all together in a final package that people can enjoy. I, I, I'm definitely addicted to the whole video production process. And uh, I think it's even, it's kind of funny because um, 
even we've, though we've only done about 12 episodes, you can see, a, I think you can see a huge difference from our very first episode when I was trying to figure out how to, what's the simplest way to put this together to our most more recent ones where we figure out the sound quality, the video quality, um, and trying to get it, it, it you know, it make each episode a little bit better. I think Brian will attest that uh, we look forward to these opportunities to be asked to make videos because it helps us to improve our skills, not only as a videographer, but of course, it, for Madalena and I, we are challenged. It's interesting. Playing a, a live performance, I think Madalena will agree, playing a live performance is one experience. Making a recording, that's way harder because, you know, in a live performance, you can let a few things slip here and there, and you're in the energy of the moment. But a recording is forever. We, we, we are very harsh critics of ourselves, and we want to make sure we get everything just right. And there's a whole different level of precision that goes into making a recording. And when we're doing this week after week, I, it's just great. I can feel the two of us becoming much, much better ensemble musicians and listening to each other and growing in our art form uh, as we do these productions. So um, I'm, I'm having a lot of fun. So I hope we continue to have fun and have more exciting projects in the future. But we've got a very busy slate coming up. So be sure to visit our website at modelq.com. Terrific. Okay, just want to play one more one more clip to uh, wish you all a very happy holiday. Again, this is from a concert from, oh, I guess about 10 years ago. So this is our way of saying goodbye. Best wishes. I thank you all for joining me and joining us to thank this af this af this morning. Thank you, Brian, Hugh, Madalena, for your wonderful uh, sharing of who you are and the work you do. And uh, I think there's one commonality that came out of everything is that we all love what we do and in enjoy what we do. And hopefully that comes through. And I hope you all have an incredibly wonderful, oh, <coughs> excuse me, incredibly wonderful holiday season. Um, whatever you celebrate, I hope it's wonderful, healthy, and we can't wait to see you at our next performances and next concerts. And um, and if you're stop and you're in Madison tomorrow afternoon, stop by Minorities, have a drink with us, um, you know, snack, listen to some music, and and just share the holiday season together. Stay well, stay warm. This has been a cold autumn. It looks like a cold week coming up. So stay well, stay warm, stay healthy. Thank you all so much. Have a great holiday and a very, very happy new year. You too. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Merry Christmas. Thank you.